As you know, have you already heard, my name's Leanne Enoch. I'm an Enoch Lanugi woman of the Kondamooka Nation, which takes in the waters and islands of Moreton Bay. So originally from North Stradbroke Island. Um, but I also have some ancestral connections into the far north. My uh, grandmother was a Kanju woman. Uh, before I go any further, let me, of course, also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today and acknowledge the elders, both past and present. And, uh, and also acknowledge all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room. Um, uh, great to see you in the room and great to see the support that you're giving to this particular subject. Um, I work for Australian Red Cross and today I want to talk to you uh, about three things. Uh, one, about organisational readiness. Uh, the next, about the importance of relationships and partnerships. And then to provide you an example of how Red Cross works in this area. Now, Red Cross, um, as you know, is a fairly large NGO, very large NGO. Um, but we're pretty new to this space. Uh, probably only in the last decade has there been some concentrated work out of this particular NGO in working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But during that 10 years, there's been some quite interesting conversations about um, how this work, um, how we actually um, progress in this work. And a lot of conversation about learning from where others have gone down this path. Uh, one of the key things that have been of interest to me um, and to many of the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff in the organisation, is our definition of mainstream. So in Red Cross, we might say this is a mainstream organisation uh, and this is a mainstream service. But when you start looking at who the most vulnerable people are in, the, in, uh, as ter in terms of our client base, we start to see a large proportion of our client base, in fact, you know, close to 60, 70% of our client base is Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. Therefore, our mainstream is not what other people would consider mainstream. So that means all of our business in Red Cross has to cater for what is now our mainstream. And it's a large proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So these topics that I want to talk to you about today are really the topics that engage the whole of Red Cross. And I want to talk to you about them from an NGO perspective, because I know uh, as a member of QCOS myself and a former board member, I know many of you here in the audience are actually here because you're, organized, you're part of an, uh, NGOs or other organisations that are, are working in this field. Uh, so for Red Cross, as I said, pretty new, but these are sort of the locations that we've been working in across the country, up to about 120, now about 140 locations right across the country. And we do a whole heap of work from um, food security type work to helping families um, find some structure and balance um, and to helping people address emergencies and disasters in their communities. But obviously, uh, this is not the point of which I want to talk. I want to talk now about our first point, and that is organisational readiness. Now, one of the key things, given that we are new to this space, is that we wanted to build critical mass. So it's like the, like the other two speakers have uh, talked about today, uh, making sure that you have Indigenous people in your organisation. If this is going to be your focus and you understand what your mainstream looks like, then you must have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in your workforce. And there are things that you must do to make sure that you can have that happening and that you can retain staff. One of those things is about being a comp culturally competent organisation. So it's on the same lines as what Wally was talking about in terms of a capability framework. What we've been investing in in Red Cross is to be ready in this space, to understand what our mainstream is, to make sure the whole organisation understands how to work well with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we want to ensure that we are moving along a continuum towards cultural proficiency. And so at the current moment, we're working on a cultural competency framework, which really is about addressing capabilities in many ways, but it's aligning competencies and um, ensuring that the training and the skill base of our staff is up to scratch in this space. Um, we, you would say along the continuum that usually you'll see um, most organisations, or I'm being generous, but most organisations are down the end of knowing and understanding. So they've been to a cultural awareness workshop or they have cultural awareness workshops. So people kind of have a knowing, they know something, they understand something, but you're not seeing it in everything that they do. You don't see it in the way that they develop policy, the way that they deliver service, the way that they set up their structures, etc. So you start to see a movement then towards this appreciating or cultural sensitivity and moving more towards practicing, demonstrating and embedding 
um, your understandings in, uh, in, in terms of working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So this has been a fundamental piece of work for our organisation, to be ready, to be, have some organisational readiness to be able to do this work well. This is just an example of some of the ways that we're trying to build that um, demonstrating, practising and embedding. So we have leadership, um, we're really addressing our leadership um, capacities in, in this work. And uh, one of them is to develop our internal advisory panel with um, co-chairs and, and to see that really dovetailed with our everyday leadership um, structures, including our national leadership team, etc. So we see direct input from everyday Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers on the ground, right into the highest level of decision making. These are the kinds of things about being organisationally ready. Uh, the next topic that I want to talk to you about is managing um, the importance of relationships and partnerships. So creating and managing relationships is absolutely key for this kind of work. And this, I guess, is where we're at today when we're talking on this we topic. We have been lucky that we have a brand, Red Cross, that has some international um, comprehension around it. People kind of know that it's something to do with humanitarianism, um, you know, and helping people. But in our brand, we have um, seven fundamental principles. And in those principles are a couple that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff um, rate as really crucial in our work with our communities. Uh, one is about neutrality and the other one in, uh, is impartiality. So be a, to be able to uh, put aside any um, uh, you know, uh, favouritism or anything like that and to be able to come at a piece of work and an issue from a space where it is you are neutral, that you can't take sides on things. And that's been a really... Uh, important part of our cycle, if you like, in the way that we create and manage relationships. We've paid a lot of attention to how we initially are introduced to the community. Um, again, like I said, we're pretty new to the space, so you can't just rock up. Um, you know, we've been uh, very conscious of the way that we actually um, uh, have our first introductions. Some of that's been about um, our own personal contacts, our professional contacts. Sometimes community organisations and communities more broadly will come to Red Cross and say, you know, can you come and help us with a few things? We want to talk to you about this. Really, it's about taking those contacts, allowing them to facilitate the relationship that we might be able to grow as we, as we um, spend more time in that community. The biggest, I guess, uh, success of our work so far in those 120 locations that I mentioned earlier has been the employment of local people. So, uh, again, like I said, critical mass, but this has been absolutely crucial, um, being able to have people who are key people in that community um, step up and put on the, um, the Red Cross brand and take those fundamental principles and then present those fundamental principles in a way that assists with what people want in that location. Um, a little bit different to what Sal was talking about before, we've been saying we want to engage without expectation. And not that that's to engage for nothing, but to basically say we're not going to go with an agenda. We don't want to say, oh, we've got the funding and then we'll turn up and have a relationship with you. We want to start from that space of saying, we're in this with you. We're wanting to work with you on what it is that you want to do next. Um, and it's from that that we're able to build those relationships and start to map out our shared understanding of the values and, um, you know, where we want to go together. That kind of foundation has been really important in the work that we do and in our most successful um, areas. So we have um, long-term engagement in the Tiwi Islands, for instance, in Port Augusta in South Australia um, and in Queensland, particularly in Warrabinda, uh, where that uh, cycle has been really essential to be able to get to a point where we share our um, values and we have a shared understanding of where it is we want to go together. And when we're going down that path, uh, we're able to support each other and making sure that, um, you know, that's uh, what we're doing is helping each Partnership other. approach has really been on the foundation of engagement. Uh, a lot of the times what we're finding is that uh, being able to move from a personal relationship, so, you know, if I'm employed in a particular location because I'm a local person there, how do we move from my personal relationship with the community or particular community groups into an organisational one so that we have sustained relationships between Red Cross um, in that particular community or its organisation? Um, that sustainability is important when you think it's some of the outcomes that we reach in, um, in the human service area are not things that happen in one year. They're not things that happen in six months. You know, we're really talking about many years 
of being able to tap away and unpack things that are all interlocked and interrelated to each other. So in doing that, we really look at our foundation of engagement. The how we are together has been a really important factor in our work. Um, and this is where the continuous resource investment um, is really starting to make its place, its, its, its importance clear to us. Um, but that part of the, um, of the, of the diagram, um, the foundational part, are really about outcomes based on relationship creation and management. Not so tangible, hard to report on, but absolutely crucial. And without that, you cannot really have successful partnerships. And those partnerships are really about service delivery and other things that might come out of your relationship with that particular community. So when you move to the top of the diagram, you know, these are where the more tangible outcomes are, can be found. And they're based on a shared understanding of outputs. And this is the what we do together. And you see that it's more about needs-based resource investment. So it might be over a period of 12 months, you've worked out the how we are together, you've invested in that, and then you start to see things that we can do together. And then next thing, there might be some funding opportunities or there, um, there might be some proposals that we put together and then go and seek out funding from other locations. So that all of the work that we end up doing together, the what we do together, is all based on how we've already worked out um, how we are going to be together in this work. So I just want to give you a bit of an example of how this looks in a community that we work in. So in Warrabinda, uh, we have a governance group there, which is, and I guess that was formed after about two years. We had about a year and a half to two years of really just investing in the engagement and relationship um, that relationship creation and management stuff. And there were some opportunities to do some things together, but there came a point where we started to become much more secure with, with each other in terms of our relationship. And that relationship then turned into a bit of a, well, how do we do this together down the track? And we, we formed what we called a Warrabinda Red Cross Community Governance Group. So you had the majority of the group uh, are local Aboriginal um, community members. Um, those community members are quite senior in terms of their eldership in that community and some are representatives of the council, of the community council. Um, there are also two senior um, Red Cross staff that sit on that group, um, ones that can make decisions, not somebody who takes the notes and goes back and finds out if we can do it, but we can make decisions at that table. And we sit together as a governance group and we pretty much direct what it is that we will be doing together in that community. So it acts a bit of a buffer for any service that we actually end up doing there. But the way that one of the elders explained it to us and when we were first forming the governance group was in this, was in this method, the freshwater salt water stream. So he said uh, the freshwater stream is Warabinda community. It has its own fish. You know, the freshwater stream has its own fish. You have your own way of uh, collecting those fish, preparing those fish to eat, and then... Uh, providing those fish to your family. So all your own tools and ways that you would do that. He said the saltwater stream is Red Cross or really any not-for-profit organisation or any non-Warabinda organisation. So we're the saltwater stream. And he said Red Cross as a saltwater stream, they have their own kind of fish. There's their own kind of way of fishing that and preparing, it, uh, preparing the fish for, for food, etc., etc. So he said there are about two different environments, very different environments, that have two different ways of working. And when they want to work together, they have to share each other's research, or, that, or they want to share each other's resources, there are many factors to consider. So he said, if you were to create too many, stream, uh, too many canals, if you like, between the two streams, what could happen is that the salt water would get into the fresh water and you know, make it all brackish and it wouldn't survive very well. And the fish that actually were in there wouldn't do very well. They'd start to just fall off. And the tools that you would normally use to prepare those freshwater fish would start to not be used so much and then you'd forget about them. And next thing, there'd be a lot of confusion about, um, you know, what, it, what Warabinda or the freshwater stream ever was once. So he said to us, he didn't want us coming in through lots of different canals, lots of different angles. Those channels, if you like, um, between the two streams would be able to dilute, they would essentially dilute the essence of each and create confusion. And that in many ways, there'd be that poison that might occur in the community. And they didn't want that. 
What they wanted instead was some way to control the way that we share each other's resources. They said, yes, there are times when we want we we need a little bit more stuff from the saltwater stream. We might want particular tools. We want, might want those fish for a while because we've run out of fish in ours. He said they were really important that we had the opportunity to grasp what was in the saltwater stream, but we didn't want it to damage the freshwater so stream. So when we then got to the point where we said, OK, we need some kind of control valve, which was the governance group. Now, that governance group, as I said, it pretty much directs everything that's coming out of the saltwater stream, and it puts some measures, it puts some parameters around what it is that ends up in the freshwater stream. So that that community is able to say, we want this and this and this for these purposes. And they have a little bit of control over how that looks in the community. So that's how he explained it to us. And that's how we do our business there. Um, it's wholly and solely based on engagement and relationship, uh, our, sorry, our relationship um, creation and management. There are partnerships that have been formed through that. Uh, but this kind of engagement allows us to ensure that both that both streams, both Red Cross and the community, can maintain what it is that they actually do without um, muddying up or brackering, brack, whatever that word is, <laughs> making the water brackish, etc., and ruining what was already fantastic. Uh, so, there, so that's basically what I wanted to share with you from a very practical viewpoint. That first thing about organisational readiness, so being culturally capable, being culturally competent, uh, the second one about putting a lot of importance on relationships and partnerships. And uh, obviously, this last uh, bit of information around an example of how that actually works in Red Cross for us.